Tom Hall is probably the bravest person I've ever met. He was a wonderful fellow, charming person. But it was that zest for life that Tom had. It just seemed like you couldn't defeat him. He had a condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or scarring of the lung. It leads to a progressive shrinkage of the lung. He was totally disabled, on oxygen, had no future. There was 100% certainty he would die of his disease. He loved life and he wanted more of it. And he was prepared to gamble on a better life. He had such incredible confidence in us. Where that came from, Lord knows, because we hadn't been successful at that point. The idea of lung transplantation was a shot in the dark. It was unlikely to be successful, given the track record. By 1983, there had been 44 attempts around the world at lung transplantation. None would be considered a success. It was a bit depressing. We desperately needed an intervention for people who had progressive end-stage lung disease. I felt that if we were not successful, the whole field of lung transplantation was going to be fallow for a while. Did I feel that if this doesn't work, it's the end? Yeah, I did. The world's first human lung transplant was performed in 1963 by Dr. James Hardy at the University of Mississippi. It was singularly unsuccessful. There was probably 15 done over the next eight years throughout the world. They were obviously marked by failure. In the 1970s, there may have been one or two per year in the entire world attempted because there was a lot of discouragement. Most of the patients died in the immediate perioperative period. It just seemed that lungs were more difficult than other organs that had been tried up to then. Really, there wasn't much enthusiasm. In fact, there was a lot of discouragement. A lot of questions were being asked of us. What are you guys doing? Why are you still doing this? It was bleak, and the first breakthroughs sort of came in the area of heart-lung transplants. It was pretty much finished for the time being, particularly once heart-lung came in and that success had been done. It was pushing single lung transplant aside. But we always thought from the very beginning that why do you want to transplant a heart if the person already has a healthy heart? It doesn't make any sense. If you could do a single lung transplant, from one donor you could get two lungs and a heart for the recipient. So you basically tripled the recipients that could benefit from the donor. So fundamentally it came down to getting over the technical issues of a lung transplant and replacing the diseased organ from 78 through to 83, there was a lot of research going on to try and conquer the problem. The big obstacle to isolated lung transplant success was bronchial healing. Joel was the guy who felt it was doable. Joel was the guy who recognized the technical issues and went to the lab. Looking at embellishing, supporting the development of a good new circulation in the bronchial tree and airway in the transplanted lung. To the point where we had some confidence that maybe we had learned something and maybe it was time to reconsider embarking on human lung transplant. And when that happened, uh, I said, aha, uh -huh, I have the perfect person in mind. We thought the ideal patient for a transplant was someone with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. That's with severe scarring and loss of function of the lung. And secondly, we wanted people who had the wherewithal to be able to get through this onerous task. So I interviewed Tom Hall. They were checking him out for his personality. If he had the transplant, what would he be like after? Was he a quitter? Tom was not a quitter. If anybody was going to have the stamina and the mental force of will to come through this, it was going to be Tom. 
I outlined for him in great detail the previous history. We had to say, no one has survived this time, you need to know that. But also why we had some optimism that perhaps what we had learned in the laboratory could be translated into the human experience. After this uh, whole long speech where I outlined all the difficulties, uh, he kind of looked at me and he said, I'll never forget his answer, he said, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity of being number 45. That's a very courageous decision. Not very many people would have done that at the time, given the track record that we had with transplantation previously. I remember Joel Cooper calling me at home and telling me we had a donor for Tom. On a blustery November afternoon, I was of the mind that I didn't want him to go to the hospital. In my mind, I was beginning to worry, you know, we, we've got to have a successor tonight. I said, I really don't think we should do this. And he said, we're going, and let's not talk about it. After all of those tries and failures, I think that, you know, there was a lot of pressure. Going up University Avenue, I'll never forget it. We didn't talk much in the car. I think we were all too into our own thoughts, our own feelings. I was probably the most nervous. I was frightened. Tom was frightened, I'm sure. Wouldn't show it, but he was. The actual transplant was after midnight sometime on the 7th of November. When I walked down the hall and entered the OR myself, I mean, the place was electric. From the time the lung is extracted from the donor until it is reattached to the recipient, the ischemic time, we didn't know how long we're safe. We know the less, the better. The speed that we had to anticipate, you know, what he needs even before he needed, so that it would seem as though both of you are thinking each other's thoughts. We thought we might have a couple of hours more than that we were concerned about. And the surgeon asked the anesthetist to start to inflate the lung. And that is the moment that you're waiting for. It's the first time you really get to see what it looks like now after several hours of it not being uh, ventilated or perfused with blood. Everybody was just glued to the chest. Now you're critically looking at where you put the air tube back together. Is it leaking air? To see that lung being inflated, and then eventually the patient starting to breathe on their own. It went extremely well. It was very smooth, the whole case. By the time we were a couple of weeks out, we figured this was going to work. It was terrific. His leaving the hospital was really quite something. Just to congratulate him and, you know, let him know that he's world famous, the first uh, single lung transplant in the world. I still have a picture of Tom and I sitting together that day, and uh, it was, yeah, it's a great memory. And that was Christmas, it was his first, Christmas Eve, I guess it'd be his first time home. He was just, he was a family man and he, he loved at home. I thought the real success would be, yes, he survives, yes, he has a better quality of life, yes, he comes off oxygen, but if we showed that he actually went back to work, that to me would be an unbelievable success. Tom's first anniversary got publicized widely. It was a great day for the program. It was a celebration for all of us since that event. Jackie Gleason would have said how sweet it is. I think it was very fortunate that we had a patient as intelligent and motivated as Tom Hall. That was the intangible, it was Tom's strength of personality. He was a terrific ambassador for our program. Well, you must feel as though it's a whole new lease on life then, after it's the health problem. Sure is. Um, all the things you dreamed of, you thought maybe I'll never get a chance to do them. 
Now they're all possible again. It's just like a whole new life gift. Yes. And he had six more years. He always said these were his gravy years. He had six plus years. I was delighted <laughs> that he had six plus years and would have loved to have had him much longer. meant that we'd hit a home run. It's our time. <laughs> it was known all across North America and around the world that lung transplant was possible and that it had occurred here. And this was going to change medicine as we knew it. We started getting um, residents and fellows that came to Toronto General Hospital to learn the procedure. From Europe, from Asia, from South America. It was wonderful for the institution. It was wonderful, I'd like to think, for Canada. I feel blessed to have been able to participate in it and contribute to the success of that program. I think I was just very fortunate to be here. Who would have thought this little girl from Barbados, <laughs> you know, coming to Canada, being able to work and to do the first surviving lung transplant in the world? Who would have thought? Who knew? <laughs> It was a real, a real sense of privilege just to be there, to, to be part of it. That was wonderful. That was truly wonderful. We were fortunate that we not only dreamt it, but we got to see it. That was really special. It inspires all of the work that we do, and including, I think, even inspires our patients to believe. That really opened uh, a hope for uh, patients who will be facing end-stage lung diseases. Their biggest legacy is that they inspired generations of surgeons that came after them with the same courage, the same innovation. Everybody that works in the program today understands the importance of that legacy and our responsibility to make sure that we stay the best lung transplant program in the world and that we continue to innovate. Taking questions from the bedside to the research laboratory, figuring it out, developing new technologies, developing solutions for, for problems that had never been solved, and the most important thing, saving lives. The program's now gone on to show that you can take the most damaged lungs and preserve them for a period of time outside the body. We put them on the ex vivo lung perfusion system that we developed, and we can actually diagnose and treat lungs outside the body and make sure they work before we put it in. They have wonderful research, wonderful funding, wonderful facilities, the marvel, the envy of anybody in the States. And this never would have happened, of course, if 1983 hadn't happened. I could never say uh, I'm jealous, maybe envious, uh, you know, uh, ought to be young again. <laughs> I'd sign up in a minute. And where are we going in the future? We're looking at, at genetic modification of organs. We're going to make a lung that looks like you, so your, your immune system won't fight it, will accept it itself. Being part of this group is, is something that I, it is a dream. I see it as a tremendous privilege to have the opportunity to continue to build on this incredible legacy. This is a place where innovation happens. This is a place where the future is made into tangible reality for patients. I've done hundreds of lung transplants now. And to this day, I, I think it is a miracle every time. You sort of realize, like, this is, this is pretty cool. It, it keeps you motivated. I once heard a miracle described as an event which leaves you with an abiding sense of astonishment. For me, lung transplantation has been that way. 
the fact that someone whose life is so burdened by the difficulty breathing, that that person can be restored to health. To me, it is still a miracle after all these years.